Hey, this is Tiger. Welcome to my stream. And before we start, please always remember we are talking about playing a computer game here. Never try what we are doing on the stream in the real world. Leave the real trains alone, as well as all, all the railway installations, even though we are trying to understand the concepts involved as thoroughly as possible. AJ, I can see you on the chat. Good evening to you and my friend CD Raider. Mein Hund jagt immer Leute auf dem Fahrrad, bis ich ihm das Fahrrad wegnahm. That is actually a really good idea. I have to talk to my dog about that. What he was saying for people who don't understand that German that my Czech friend is using so well, he says his dog was always chasing people on the bike until he took his bike away. Chili, what do you think about that? Should I take your bike away? No, I think she can chase people without the bike, with the bike just as well. Um, what are we going to do today? We are going to play uh, on a train, in a scenario, in a DLC. No, not in a scenario, in a DLC that we have not used so far. It is a Rivet Games DLC, the West Cornwall Local. I have to admit, I was not so super excited about this DLC. I got it anyway, and what you can read about it on the forums is not so super enthusiastic, but it is one of the DLCs that surprised me in a positive way, because it is really nice. I like, I like riding. Uh, on the train there, I like driving trains there. Um, it has a nice uh, dynamic profile as well as um, uh, gradient-wise as uh, speed-wise. So it is a good DLC, I should say. So I like using West Cornwall Local and we are running on the class 150 stroke 2. What is a Diesel multiple unit with a hydrokinetic transmission. If you watched the stream two weeks ago, we talked about the diesel mechanical transmission on the class 101, and the class 150 is still a quite oldish train, but uh, obviously a much newer train than the class 101. The whole a family that the 150 belongs to is uh, called the Sprinter family, the 140s, where the Pacers, the 150s are the Sprinters, and the 160s are the Networkers, and we have a 166 on the Great Western Railway. Um, for example, it's also a DMU with almost the same uh, hydrokinetic transmission that the 150 is using. So this will be the topic of today, um, hydrokinetic transmission. What is a transmission that really fascinates me because it's a, it's a, a technology that is not so super intuitive as le at least me as a non-technical person uh, had some trouble uh, understanding it, but I think um, the general principle, and not more, I can tell you, is is easily to grasp. Uh, is easy to grasp, and and then you know how to drive the train. And that is this is why we are talking about the technical stuff here. If you want to go into the technical details, you have to watch somebody else's video because obviously I'm not qualified to tell you all the technical details but what I'm trying to do is to share my limited understanding of the principle of how it works and what we can take out of it uh, for driving the train. So what is AJ saying on the stream? Trains like this one, do they always have a fixed length or are there adaptable parts? Well, trains of this kind typically come as sets those here come as sets of two. Sometimes you have um, different lengths, meaning like to have two car sets, three car sets, four car sets, five car sets, and they typically stay coupled together. Um, with some of them, it is technically possible to take out the middle car, for example, but uh, uh, it is usually only done 
at least to my knowledge, if it is necessary because something is broken or it needs to be replaced. And um, what you always can do, obviously, or with most of them, what you can do is to couple more of those sets together so that you can have longer trains that are more or less, uh, you know, uh, it's a train composed of more diesel multiple units just as you do that with the modern trains nowadays as well so our class 150 stroke 2 i will also turn on the service marker i tried to find a service that is a bit um spiked with signal action when i tried to do it uh, this afternoon to see if I got the right service. I did not uh, find it again, unfortunately. So um, maybe this is a bit of a random element with a signal action, but we will see what we're up to. We will be driving along the Cornish main line from Penzance to St. Ostel in Cornwall. Um, and uh, yeah on on our 150 what we will be doing we will have a look at the train a bit on the controls uh slowly what well, we need to set it up and then i will restart the service and go through it uh a bit quicker because uh, they did not give you a lot of uh, time to set up the trains it's more or less you need to get started at once when the service starts otherwise you will be late at the start so Let's look at our train from the outside. The DLC is set in the early 90s. That is before the privatization of railway uh, endeavors in the United Kingdom. And it was a time when the British railways got separated into different firms. The sectorization was this episode called and the regional railways is one of those firms that the British railways got subdivided and they are as the name tells you were more or less for running trains in the more rural areas um, in the regions not so much in the center and on the main lines but more on the regional ways it was called if I'm not mistaken provincial uh, first and then they figured out that this is maybe not the greatest name and sounds a bit provincial so what else do we have here this is Pansans in the Pansans station this is Pansans the Ord uh, the the Ord the 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 town more or less it is a seaside town a holiday resort as well here you can see the beach and the really nicely done uh, see over there we will see what that is that is saint Ma saint michael's mount uh well uh, uh, an isle that is a tidal isle more or less that is only an isle when the flood is high when the tide is high and there is actually a castle on it we might see it when we are passing along back to our train what do we need to do to set it up like uh most of the time with these oldest trains and with British trains at all, we have a master key to uh, unlock this uh, command stand here. Then we would probably have to turn on the lights. We need day lights. We need the marker lights switched on. We need the tail lights switched off in the service here. This is already preset. On other services, it is not preset unfortunately the instrument light switch i always like to turn it on because you can see better for the safety systems this is where you turn on the aws and this is where you turn on the dsd vigilance device we have a paddle for that but it is not actually um modeled as a paddle is it no i don't think so but you have it in the ESD reset and separatable so you can actually put it on two different keys the DSD reset and the AWS reset for unlocking the doors you have those buttons here 
in the real train I think you would have to press them both simultaneously so that they actually open on the correct side but you can also use your keyboard shorts of course but those lights here actually tell you if you're not using the HUD that the doors are actually closed and or opened and then you need to set your reverser to forward then the self test unfortunately the TPWS uh, indicators do not light up during the safe test what they should do I think but they don't about this indicator the TWS indicator what I, what I have seen is that this train here is the only British train where the TWS brake demand light the rev one up here actually starts flashing when uh, a penalty brake application is triggered unlike on most of the other British trains in the game where the red light is lit up steadily what is in my opinion not correct so it should flash red if the emergency brake is um, initiated and then after it got acknowledged and you waited your 60 second I think it is timer to run down then it runs steadily and then you know that you can uh, go on again yeah, that is more or less the train. What else is there? We have a destination board on the outside. You can see it here. It says not in service for our service. So we would actually have to set this to where we want to go. And this is sand or stealth. So we don't have to, to wrench around a lot. We, ch we can just set it and go. Let's restart and do it for real. Doors open. You can open the doors even before you turn on the command stand. Day, tail light off, mark lights on, instrument all good. And we're going to Saint Ostel, Saint Ostel. Unfortunately, I cannot set the destination board for the rear end without running there. So we're releasing the brakes, and you can see you have to be a bit generous with the throttle to get this train moving in the beginning. You have seven notches, and. Uh, you're in quite fast with your notches to get that train moving and this is a thing that comes with the hydrokinetic drive this while well, really gunning the throttle up to a quite high notch when starting is uh, yeah well you read that about a lot of trains that have this hydrokinetic transmission and we will see why it is possible here on a train with a diesel mechanical or even a diesel electric transmission you would never do that because you would either break your gears or fry your traction motors but the hydrokinetic transmission takes this and needs it. Our hydrokinetic transmission has two steps, so not like three steps, like on the V60 that we had last week. So there will be only one transition and we will see that quite uh, distinctly. It always happens when you're traveling about 48 miles per hour. If the modeling here actually is prototypical and reflects how this train behaves in real life, I have obviously no means of knowing. I can only see what the train is doing in the game. So, we get a green here. Well, 
I think on this server sometimes I got the yellow here. But let's just see what happens. <laughs> on the left you can see the Ponsandai in sightings, I think they are called. Running away from Pansens. There are some scenarios on this route where you start here on the in the sidings and have to go with your train through those washing installations here. Boy, it's quite sweet. Here in the background you can see St. Michael's Mount with the castle on top. I can just look at the scenery because we are in a 70 um, stretch here and you see even in with uh, throttle set to the max it takes us quite a while now here was the point when the transmission shifted from the torque converter to the fluid coupling so the sound of the motor of the engine got uh, lower, got softer and deeper indicating that it went back to lower rotations per minute and now it is accelerating again 75 here and greens so we can actually gun it out towards St. Earth here the nice view to St. St. Michael's Mount Some people say driving those DMUs on the Great Western Railroad or even here is quite boring because you're more or less gunning everywhere um, in full throttle and wait until you get to the next station. That is true for some parts but with the highly dynamic profile of this route um, I think there is still enough to do it's a bit different on the Great Western Railroad Railway, sorry We're not in the United States, on the Great Western Railway Because everything is quite even there and You don't have a lot of speed restrictions But here You have some speed restrictions and Typically you'll get a Mopeth board That warns you about it but still you need to know where you actually need to slow down so that you don't lose your momentum and don't be so late at the next station because you don't have enough power to accelerate uphill as much as the limit, the track limit would probably allow so, this is the bridge with the signal underneath. At the next bridge, we should actually start slowing down because we have to stop at St. Earth. And uh, this is one of the stops where we have to stop downhill when we're going into the direction to St. Ostel. can see that we are going uphill because the speed is falling. Now I take away the throttle, put the brakes to one. We have not just one, two full and emergency, so there is not so much variation in the brakes, but you can still work with that quite okay, in my opinion. You might have noticed there are actually some of the older semaphore signals put up here. It's 
So let's see where we get with my breaking or if we have to add a bit more in the end. No, we have to release it actually. Oh, almost. Here to the left is where the branch line to St. Ives starts. So those trains here on those platforms, they are not going the way to St. Austell as we are doing that. Oh, did I open the doors on the wrong side? That happens if you're explaining the outside. And this is actually represented in the game and it is a nice route. It is limited to 30. But it is beautiful. Most of the time you see the northern coast coast of uh, Cornwall. Penzance is on the southern course coast of Cornwall. And what we see now is we passed a green exit signal. But you might not see it on the stream, but I can see it on my uh, uh, TV here. The next signal is red. So we did not get a caution, a caution signal, no yellow. Approaching the red. The rules say go as close to the signal so that you can still see its aspect properly. Put the brakes in full service, then we activate the DRI. And since there is no diamond at the signal, we would tell the signaler that we are waiting at the signal SE65. Something like, what is our number? 1A96, waiting at red signal SE65. And the signaler would probably tell us, yeah, it's okay. You can wait here. I got you. But maybe while we are waiting here, we can look at the presentation. And for this week, I actually strained my, 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 my abilities in PowerPoint to actually um, demonstrate what I think is the working principle of a hydrokinetic transmission. Typically, they tell you this is a diesel hydraulic train. Hydraulic transmissions come in two types, hydrokinetic and hydrostatic. Hydrostatic um, is the one that is not used in, typically on DMUs. There are, to my knowledge, a couple of shunter locomotives that use a hydrostatic transmission. If uh, one of them makes its way into the game then i will gladly talk about that one what i will talk about today is the hydrokinetic transmission where you use a fluid and the flowing the kinetic energy the movement energy of the fluid to transmit the power from the diesel engine to the wheels we have the same problem that we have talked about two weeks ago in the diesel mechanical uh, transmission stream we have a diesel engine that is rotating a drive shaft that is probably essentially what it is doing and we need to get this rotation to the wheels at the same time we have the old problem that we need a lot of torque in the beginning when we want to start our vehicle and we need 
less torque but higher rotations or higher turning velocity when we want to go faster. So this balancing between torque and turning speed, turning force and turning speed, we obviously have that uh, on a train of that kind as well. And we will see how this is uh, how this is done, how this is dealt with. Before we um, go on, there are more or less two different types of a trend or of, of gadgets that work in the hydrokinetic transmission. One is a fluid coupling uh, and the other one is a torque converter. We will just see what the difference is. We will start with the fluid coupling because it is the uh, more easier and the more easy thing to understand. But uh, in a train that of the kind that we were running, when you started first, you would be using the torque converter and then switch to the fluid coupling what is happening on this train at about 48 miles per hour. So this is our first wheel here. It is called the pump impeller quite often. And this is a wheel we are looking on top of it. And the white thing in the middle is our driving shaft that comes from the engine. So we're looking along X axis and it is turning. This is what the arrow is supposed to indicate. And fixed to this shaft is a bladed wheel, like a wheel with paddles or blades that is, um, well, that can turn around and, well, is turned by the diesel engine. And uh, then let's imagine this happens in, well, some sort of a vessel where there is a liquid, a fluid. It was originally in the beginning water, but uh, later on uh, it was replaced obviously by an hydraulic oil, a very specific oil. And to understand the principle, I just picked out one drop of this oil, one particle, uh, and obviously this is just a simplification, but just let's look at one drop and how it gets um, accelerated by this moving, turning, rotating red wheel. Just imagine this one drop of liquid and as soon as the red wheel is turned in the direction of the driving shaft, then it is at the same time moved to the right because the blades are pushing it there and then it flees the center. So we have two components. One of it is in the rotation, in the direction of the rotation, and the other one is fleeing the center. So if we turn our wheel uh, more, then this drop gets moved to the outside and at the same time always has these two components of acceleration that this drop of liquid actually um, experiences. At a certain point, it will leave the edge of the blade and then it will have a momentum of that kind, more or less. And we place another wheel on the outside. I uh, drew it in blue and it also has blades and our drop hits those blades, our liquid. And this is called the turbine wheel and it is connected with the output, more or less with the wheels. So with the axles, with the wheels, mechanically, um, the output shaft. So what happens if our drop of liquid hits those blades? Obviously it gets stopped, it gets slow, slowed down because it hits the blade and at the same time because it has a momentum that drives it outwards, it will slide along this blade. And some of, it, some of the momentum will be transferred to the blade and the wheel and the outer wheel starts turning as well while this idealistic drop of liquid is moved to the outside. And so our wheel obviously gets a bit of the momentum of this particle of liquid and starts turning and because there is not only one particle but many 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 it is a fluid this happens uh, a lot of times if you want to use my model here and this is why the uh, 
blue will gets accelerated bit by bit by bit or by because this liquid is propelled outside by the rear wheel and uh, caught by the blue wheel and so the blue wheel gets uh, gets uh, accelerated as well while the liquid gets back so since you do not want to use up uh, in an infinite um, amount of oil this oil is just uh, directed back to the red wheel and accelerated again so that it is actually circling between those two wheels as soon as this blue wheel starts turning the next particles of liquid that hit those blades get a slightly different uh, momentum so as long as the blue wheel is turning slowly or it is standing the liquid will hit it hard with its force and will be uh, directed away and will transfer a lot of momentum to the blue wheel and it will have like a curve like this it will lose a lot of its momentum against the blade of the blue wheel and gets directed to the outside at the same time accelerating the blue wheel if the blue wheel is turning faster then uh, the curve that our or the path that our uh, drop of liquid will go will be straighter because the blade is moving away so it can't pass in a straighter line until the blue wheel is turning as fast as the red wheel is turning then the drop of liquid can just pass through without transferring transferring any more energy so we can see this contraption here is more or less automatically fulfilling our uh, demand for slow speed high torque in the beginning when accelerating and low torque high rotation speed when it is getting faster so this is why we um, ha have at least a part of this problem solved just because of the blue wheel is lagging behind the red wheel and gets accelerated bit by bit by the streaming liquid that is propelled by the red wheel This was, as I said, the fluid coupling. Coupling because the red input is coupled to the blue output by the streaming liquid. And when you start driving into this fluid coupling, then you transfer a lot of torque to the blue wheel. And the faster the blue wheel is turning until it is turning as fast as the red one, uh, then the torque gets less and less and uh, obviously the rotations are faster on the outside this is the fluid coupling but to be fair this is not enough to allow us to start our train to accelerate our dmu from a standstill we actually need more torque than this and more torque than our diesel engine can provide and this is where the torque converter comes in it is let's say the same principle that we have here but something is added that allows us to convert some of the uh, of the force of the energy that goes into rotations to torque so that we will have a lower rotating output but with higher torque and that is what we need when starting our train so let's look again this is the same that we just had uh, but let's look at it from 90 degrees uh, uh, turned so from the left side or from the right side so this is cut between um, this red wheel here again so this on the left is showing that wheel from looking at it from the right side and now we are looking on this wheel here from the left and the blue one is built in this way around it so you can see there is actually a channel where the fluid can go through and then we built a housing around so that our fluid can go this way circle this way it runs through the red one gets accelerated and then it hits the blades in the blue one and starts turning the blue shaft so this is the end where the diesel engine is attached to and this is the end where the wheels are attached to and this is circling 
all around and it is built in a way that you have like a donut uh, shaped form uh, torus i think is, is the uh, actual word for it but uh, with a donut shaped form i think we come uh, pretty close and in this donut shaped form we have the liquid rotating and transferring the energy from the red input to the blue output and at the same time this makes the stream in the liquid go like a spiral along so it does not stay in one place like it is shown here more or less but it is spiraling its way through the donut shape if we want to increase the torque that is transferred to the blue wheel then we need to build something in this is why we have this room here so uh, ob obviously all this room that the liquid has to go through here in in this setup is not used so if we only have uh, a fluid coupling like on the slide before um this would be a waste so this is why fluid couplings are not const are not built in a way like this but they built are more or less like this so one of the two ends sits more or less inside the other and our donut uh, is placed in a way like this and then the liquid can rotate in the donut shaped form um, and transfer transfer the energy from the red input to the blue output so if you only need a fluid coupling it would be uh, it would look from cutting through it and looking at it from the side more or less like this in my clumsy uh, diagrams here so why did we build our thing like this with all that uh, dead room that the liquid needs to go through because we can build a third wheel inside here that actually does the torque conversion uh, and this wheel like yellow uh, is fixed so it does not turn it has blades like the other two uh, wheels but it does not turn it is a stator it is built uh, fixed inside this um, this casing and what does it actually do if we have blades like this and it is called a guide wheel to get the fluid back in a way that we want it to have and uh, i put it above my two other wheels so that you can sh can see where it is sitting if you look at it from the the side you have blades that look a bit like cat's ears and they catch the fluid that is uh well that, that comes from the blue wheel and redirect it to the red wheel and uh, why does this convert the torque this happens because those yellow uh, blades that are in the guide wheel actually uh, make the spiraling more intense so without the yellow wheel maybe you would have a very narrow spiral in in the stream of your liquid and with those uh, yellow blades you can uh, extend it and then the liquid has also uh, has already a greater momentum along the donut when it hits the red blades that propel it even more and then you have a higher component of the force that is pushing the liquid against the wheels instead of uh, having it go outside and this will transfer more torque to the blue wheel and uh, to the expense obviously of the rotation speed so all the people who are technically savvy in that out there please don't crucify me for that i really tried to do my best to share my understanding as a layman of all these things so that we know uh, uh, enough about this technology to be able to um, use it when driving our trains and what we can see we can accelerate our red wheel here uh, quite fast even when we are still in a standstill this is why we can put our throttle into notch four or five out of seven when the train is still standing and then you have an effect like uh, what sometimes happens when you try to accelerate uh, a boat or a ship you hear the 
the propeller at the end of the of the ship already turning and 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 splashing in the water but the, sh the ship is still sitting in place and then all of a sudden whoop, it slowly starts uh, starts uh, accelerating and this is more or less the same principle here the red wheel turns and creates the 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 stream inside the liquid and the liquid pushes against the blue turbine wheel and slowly accelerates it and um, then goes through the cycle of uh, with with more speed that the turbine wheel is getting uh, the less torque is transferred and yeah the effectiveness of of the coupling is at a certain point more or less in the middle and and, and then it uh, decreases and um, for having a train work in in a, in a proper range you typically cannot stand with one of those uh, connectors but you would have to switch two of them or even more of them uh, in a way that you can use different parts of your transmission in different speed ranges so like on our train here we would start using this torque converter when we want to accelerate our train and at a certain point we don't need to do that the transmission does that automatically it will switch from the torque converter to the fluid coupling at about 48 miles per hour and uh, then go through the cycle there to reach even higher speeds Do I have anything else? Yeah, well, what we have here, I showed this momentum that our fluid is getting from the yellow blades. It is pushed inside the rotating red blade and so it gets an even higher force into that or moment into that direction. So converting the torque. So much for the presentation for today. I find this is a very fascinating technology and helped me at least understand why on trains of that kind DMUs with a hydrokinetic transmission you would well gun in your throttle so high when starting off a station. without breaking the transmission or the engine. We're still waiting at our red light. Probably there will be a train coming from the opposite direction. Yes, there is the train. A 47 with some Mark 1 cars. And then, quite soon, we should get the green light here. Do we need to call the signaler again that we are through? That we are here still waiting? No. Don't forget to turn off. The DRA. So, just what I said. Yank the throttle into 5. It took some time. You can hear the engine revving up. And then with a certain delay, the train starts moving. This is when the torque converter needs to accelerate the blue wheel, the turbine wheel, to transfer the energy from the red wheel to the blue wheel. We're in a stretch of track where we can go 75, but we will have to slow down to 45 before we get to hail. Here is already the Mopeth board announcing the 45. And we will see, probably we won't be even able to reach the 45 until we get to the speed restriction. 
But nevertheless, we are already late because of the red light, so we don't have any speed to give away. We will just accelerate as hard as we can until we get we, 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 until we get to the speed restriction. Here you can see the sign coming, and we're not even at the 45. Now we can throttle down now. Okay. That was a bit of stopping the train when you're late. Not so super cozy for the passengers, I guess. Yeah, but look at this. Some people are always complaining about the scenery in this DLC because it is dull. I don't really think it is. Are there lag spikes? Is, is it the game or the stream that's got those lag spikes? Um, I'm not seeing any uh, lag spikes in in the in in the game. Must be the stream then. Maybe the internet problems that we experienced earlier today have returned. What would be annoying? So for starting the train at the station, I like to typically use the protocol of closing the doors as soon as the doors are closed fully. Throttle in one brakes fully released and then not wait for the brakes to release but put the throttle into five while the brakes are releasing as soon as the train is moving throttle to six as soon as the train is at about seven to ten miles to seven on the throttle again if that is the way you would drive this train in real life I obviously have no means of knowing but in the game it works quite well. In the tutorials they always tell you to put the throttle into notch 1 before releasing the brakes. Since you do not have a holding brake in the train and sometimes you are standing in a gradient at the station there is no way then other than starting to throttle up when you release the brakes because the throttle needs to take over the forward propulsion force as soon as the brakes are released. We have a lot of those nice viaducts on the line here. I think this is Angarak Viaduct, but I'm not sure. You also have a couple of uh, stations that are no longer in use that we're passing here. At one of them you will have to slow down to 50. Or it's not a problem for us because we are plowing uphill here towards Camborne. So we are obviously not faster than 50, but still you need to be wary because in the 50 reduction there is a part 
where you can accelerate because the grading is not hard. Ah, this is Angarak here. If I'm not mistaken. And you can see even with running in full throttle we can't really accelerate beyond the 40 in this gradient here. So are the lag spikes still there, AJ? Because the, the game is running smoothly, it must be the connection to Twitch. It's fine now. Okay, nice to hear. Yeah. And I totally appreciate in this DLC if you look around and you can see that there are actually dells and valleys and hills next to the track and it's not just like flat land like in Hamburg or Bremen Oldenburg sometimes. So I don't need a lot of fancy landmark stuff, but a dynamic terrain around the train makes up for a lot. So we're approaching one of those disused stations. You can see the Mopas board for the 50 reduction and when you look at, at the timer you can see one problem of the DLC is obviously that this train is not able to accelerate hard enough to make it in time to Camborne. You lose a lot of time versus the the timetable when going uphill and you can see it here on the on, on the diagram we are far below the speed limit all the time there had been a physics fix as I understand and uh, well maybe after this fix the train is just not powerful enough to do the timetable anymore here the 50 reduction at this disused station that we're passing here And now we're running downhill a bit, so we need to, here was the switch to the fluid coupling, here is the 6 design, and here we just need to be careful that we don't accelerate too fast beyond the 50 until the whole train is past the 6 design. We should be in Camborne already, but we have still two miles to go. There is no speed reduction in Camborne for the station, so we can just stop there out of line speed. If I remember everything correctly. I'm try to reproduce the speed limits and everything out of my root knowledge. So I hope we're not in for a nasty surprise at one point or the other. Another viaduct here or viaduct. Yeah, but again, you can go full throttle and still not speed beyond the 60. Camborne, when you're approaching it, coming from Penzance, is one of those stations where you're going uphill really hard. 
so you need to be wary not to stall the train too early. Getting a yellow here. Knowing that we have to stop at the station anyway and the next signal is beyond the station, we don't need to slow down because of the yellow. Just telling us that the exit signal at the station is at is showing a red. Starting to rain. So, I'm coasting uphill here towards the red light, but you can see we are losing a lot of momentum just from the gradient. And it will actually be quite difficult to not stop too early. No, it's okay. And we can steal the red light. Don't forget to activate the DRI. At uh, the DRA. DRI was a band when I was young in the 90s. So we're sitting at the red signal. Maybe we should inform the signaler. Sitting at Camborne Station at red signal. And then we should probably read out the number that I cannot read because of the rain at the moment. signal is still red, we have to wait. Getting delayed even more. This is actually a unique station building here at Camborne. Why can I not freeze the angle? It's nice. No. If you look up Camborne, and what there is to know about Camborne is, is that there was obviously, almost 200 years ago, a very uh, famous road locomotive, so a steam engine that was going on the road, not on tracks, the Puffing Devil, and it was invented here and making its way up. Camborne Hill. And apparently there is even a, a song connected with that incident. Well, well, you can see even for the trains in the first half of the 1990s it is not so easy to get up Camborne Hill. As soon as we are allowed to leave Camborne Station, I think there is a train coming from the opposite direction that we are waiting for. No, not yet. And we're going into Redruth. What is, as I understand, more or less a mining town. Or was a mining town. And mining was still a thing coal in Cornwall. Ah, no. The light switched. DRI. And now it is important that you throttle up as soon as the brakes are released so that the train does not roll downhill backwards. Here is another 150 coming from the opposite direction. Obviously that is the reason why we were held at the red signal. Cylinder 60. Limit. Today we're only getting the thunderstorm in the game. Isn't that nice, AJ? It is not the RI, it is the RA. The drivers 
reminder appliance. I'm sorry for that. DRI was a uh, well indie band in the 90s, dirty rotten imbeciles. Sometimes this sneaks into my into my speech. So I think the line speed will go from 60 to 70 until we get to Redruth. Redruth has, if I'm not mistaken, a limit of 40. Here's the 70. A limit of 40 that starts somewhere in front of the station already. With the rain and the mist, we cannot see the boards, the signs from far away. So we'll actually have to pay attention to not to be too fast after passing the Mopev board. Or at least there is a Mopev board. So you don't get startled by that. Again, you could feel the point where we switched from the torque converter to the fluid coupling in the transmission at 48 miles. And we will see what velocity we will reach until we have to slow down for the stop at Redruth. Red Ruth is again an uphill stop. So I'm staying inside the cab and not using the externals because I don't want to miss the Mopus board for the 40 reduction. Have to be careful not to speed because we are actually at a 70. Can take away the throttle a bit or use the throttle to try to keep the speed at 70 as long as possible since we are already late. I think there is the 40 limit. Ah yeah, I am actually too late for the 40 limit. I missed the Mopeth board after all, even though I was so careful anyway but I just made it you see 30 30 points someone can go into the back and collect the passengers that fell off their seats and again you can use the gradient to slow down the train here in Redruth Here is no red signal, we don't need to use the DRA. So, Redruth, Mining Town.
yeah so you can see that you can actually put the throttle into notch one when the brakes are still applied you will get a traction lock starting at brake notch two no traction lock when the brakes are only in notch one but this lock gets removed as soon as you release the brakes so here the limit goes up to 70 so unlike on other trains you don't need to throttle down to zero then release the brakes and then you get removed or get the traction lock removed but you can have the throttle on and then release the brakes What you need to be careful about though is that you should not put the throttle into any notch higher than zero as long as the doors are open because then the lock does not get removed after the doors have been closed as at least this is what I have experienced so always wait for the doors to close fully you can see it that the lights on the door buttons get extinguished and then throttle to one release the brakes at the same time more or less throttle to five and then you can also start uphill without the train rolling backwards we're approaching Truro now Truro is from what I have read the only city in Cornwall so it's hard to say it's the main city it's definitely the, the capital in Cornwall the seat for the, the county seat or whatever this is called I think it's called the county seat and the only city and at the same time our last stop before we get to St. Austell we are in a 70 limit now we will if I am not mistaken encounter a limit to 55 that gets raised to 65 before we get to Truro so weather is getting better there is a church I have not been able to find out what that is, that structure here. Maybe just some. No, it was passed already. Here was the Morpeth board for the reduction to 55. And I think it will be at the end of this. Viaduct. Yeah, you can see it. It was a bit early on the brakes, but it's okay. Fifty five here. It's always sad, right? When we're in, in the parts where we can accelerate because we're going downhill, then there are limits. But for a reason. Soon enough, we will be allowed to accelerate to 65 again. Here is another disused station. And I think there's a bend to the left after that, and then we can accelerate to 65 again. Another one of those viaducts. 
and here is the 65. No, 60 it is. But still, we can accelerate. Before we get to true row, in true row we will have a limit to 30. That starts just in front of the platform. So if people are complaining that the landscape is dull, I have to declare I like what River did on the landscape here. Yeah, I should not have looked at the landscape too much because that made us go over the speed limit. It is 60 still and it will be 60 until we get to the reduction in front of True Row. If I remember correctly. So is the rain done now? No, it is not done yet. And still we are super late. But hey, what are we supposed to do? We got held at two reds. Of course we are late. So getting closer to True Row, last two miles, and the real. And the rain does not want to stop. Sometimes you can hear the sounds that those warning installations for the level crossings make so we're more or less coasting in to true row As soon as we see here's the Morpeth board for the 30 long left then we will see a bridge I guess an underpass and if we start breaking in notch 1 as soon as we get to the underpass we should be good to slow down to 30 until we reach the platform
Here's the entry signal. There is a 37. We always, we almost were good. Not quite, I had to go to notch 2 in the braking. Alright, this is Truro. Single city in Cornwall. Well, we might be a bit late, but at least we stopped in the correct position. By the way, I find the passenger behavior actually quite good. Most of the time you have people getting on the train, getting off the train on all the stations. Sometimes they are part of the tracks before they get onto the train. That is weird, but in general, also a good job. Doors closed, throttle to one, brakes released, throttle to five, or four and then five. And as soon as we are moving, six. At seven to seven. Still in the 30, but here is already the sign for the 70. So we can just accelerate in full throttle to get out of that. Well, unfortunately, we can't see the city. Can only dimly see the cathedral in the mist over there. Well, and the weather deteriorated again. What's up, Cornwall? We're in May, aren't we? Second thunderstorm in a row. Almost hit the train. So I think when we're dri driving out of Truro, here is the part where we run through two tunnels. And after that, what would happen if the lightning strike hit the train? Well, not much, I guess. It's like a a Faraday's cage, like a car, it would just go around all the passengers and us and into the rails most probably. Don't know what it does to the track circuitry and all this stuff. But we should be quite safe in our train. So, now the last leg, Truro to Saint, Saint Austell, and we're going into the first tunnel, the Buckshead Tunnel, I think is the name, if I'm not mistaken. Light at the end of the tunnel is quite dim, I like that, it looks good. Well. Now it does not look that good anymore, but now we have our rain back. There's one more tunnel, and then we are approaching a part of the track where it goes from two tracks to just one track, unidirectional. 
after a town, here was the switching point again, at a town called Probus, I think is the name. What is weird, it sounds like some moon at Saturn or whatever, or like a space station. Probus. But it's not. It's where we have to go to a single line and there will be a speed limit to I think it's 60 rise race to 65 afterwards and typically we're getting a yellow signal in front of that part and that one that yellow is actually a difficult one because usually when you're approaching a yellow signal with 70 miles per hour you should start using your brakes because you need to be able to stop at the next signal that presumably is red but if you do that here then you will lo lose a lot of momentum and as soon as you are on the unidirectional line you won't be able to accelerate easily so you would like to keep your momentum coming down hill here with 70 miles per hour so you would probably here's already the mopus board for the 60 reduction you will probably try to be late on the brakes as long as the signals allow that So, the, uh, behind this bridge there should be the next signal. Or at least soon after that bridge. Yeah, here it is. And you can see this yellow. We need to acknowledge it. And, yeah. If we are starting losing our momentum now, then we have a problem. Otherwise, if we don't lose our momentum, then we probably won't be able to stop if the signal is actually red. So what do we do? We know that the signal is actually visible from quite a long way or it would be if it weren't for the fog. Here is now we can see it faintly that it is green. But we had to lose our momentum. We slowed down to 25 because it should not really be f faster than 25 miles per hour when you're approaching the AWS magnet if you don't see the signal. And now we have a hard time accelerating because it's going uphill again. Here's the limit to 60 that was announced with the Mopus board in front of the tunnel. And now we will go across the switch. You can't see it yet, but here it is. And after the switch, immediately the limit goes back to 65. And we are sitting here, trudging along with 35 and trying to accelerate uphill again. So without the rain, you can actually keep most of your momentum coming around the corner, see the signal from afar, and then you know you don't need to slow down that much. But in conditions like this, visibility is poor. Also the adhesion is less good as it is usually. So what should we have done? differently nothing we had to slow down so to be able to stop in front of the red signal safety first punctuality second at least according to the German directives and third is economical yeah running the trains economically economy is third safety 
greater than punctuality, punctuality greater than economy. Well, but this condemns us to really go slow through this unidirectional line here. From what I've read, it's actually quite an interesting fact why this line here is unidirectional. It started out as being a bidirectional line, even in that part here, uh, until 1985 or something. And then the second track got removed. And why would they remove a second track? Um, there are a lot of coal mines here, and coal mines have a tendency of weakening the mountains because they are actually drilling holes and cavities into the mountains and then the mountain is not as stable anymore and the whole land is not as stable anymore or at least that can happen and then I think the word is subsidence or subsidence I don't know exactly how to pronounce the I in that word and that means that the earth is sagging towards the center of the planet and uh, so you don't have enough stable ground to have your rail tracks on, especially if there are through trains running on the same part of the track at the same time. And so, one track got removed. By now, I think, when was it 2014 or 2004? I'm not sure anymore what I read about it. Then uh, the second track was reinstalled after reinforcing the ground and nowadays this part of the track has two tracks so this bottleneck got removed then obviously you can imagine as long as one train is sitting in this unidirectional bit the train from the other direction can't come and then it is extremely annoying if the other train like ours is slow because it had to slow down down at the bottom of the next climb and then can't really accelerate uphill here was the switching point at least we made it to the 48 miles per hour and now we might actually be able to accelerate a bit better the climb is no longer here you can see we're going downhill and now we actually have to take care not to go faster than the 65 that are allowed until we get to Saint or Saint Austell Before we get to St. Austell, we will be back on a double line. The unidirectional bit ends at a place called Burn Gallo. Gallo, Burn Gallo with an U. Not like a gallo where you would hang someone. At Burn Gallo there is actually um, a branch line coming in from the left. That is a line that uh, does not run passenger services, but it is a freight line that leads to an area where there are where there are a lot of uh, or used to be at least a lot of um, what is it called China clay mines or quarries I think is the better word and those freight trains were taking this china clay down this line 
but it is unfortunately not in the DLC. That would be, would be funny. And from what you can read, there were actually two incidents where freight trains coming from this China clay area towards St. Ostel uh, had a runaway train scenario, so could not slow down anymore. And uh, drivers on trains coming from St. Ostel going towards Truro had actually to reverse back towards St. Ostel to not get involved into a head-on collision with a runaway freight train. Just imagine driving your train uphill and then you can <laughs> then you see a runaway freight train coming on, on your line from the other, uh, other direction. This is a situation where you would think, oh, where is my reverser? And then full throttle <laughs> backwards. So we're closing in to the part where we get our second line back, where the branch line from the China clay quarries comes in. And there is also like a depot. Here is the line coming in on the left. See the depot on the left with some sidings and now we just more or less coast down towards St. Ostel. Always going downhill so a runaway freight train coming down this line must be a frightening sight. This is the yellow in front of the station. We will have to stop at the station. The red one is the exit signal. And we managed to be almost three minutes late already. But again, not our fault. I asked for the signaling action and we got the signaling action so I will just have the train coast downhill. St. Ostel is a downhill stop coming from this direction so we will have to use the brakes early enough and maybe even switch to brake notch 2. can already see sound Saint Austell to the left and right of this viaduct. And here is Saint Austell station. Let's see where we get with our speed and our brake notch for probably too slow. I have to release it a bit.
here we are. At least we have a r nice round number. That's the last stop for us. The line goes on to Plymouth in Devon, but it is not represented in the DLC, obviously. You can see they want us to go into the siding. They show the two white lights next to the red, allowing us to pass the red light. Unlike German trains, we don't need to press any Befehl 40 taste or maneuver key. We can just pass it like this and go over to the siding. Still going downhill quite heavily here. So be prepared to stop your train at the siding. Forty yards, thirty yards. Now I overbraked it a bit. Sometimes my keyboard control fingers are too clumsy. But no. Here we are. All right, that was this service here. I will go back to free roam so we can see our nice class 150 sprinter at the siding at St. Austell. We have a, have a thunderstorm here so I cannot show off the city. Um, I hope you enjoyed my explanations of the hydrokinetic transmission on the train and why we need to know that bit so that we can drive the train more or less properly or at least in a way that it is fun. It's more or less the same principle on the British uh, Rail Class 166. It is also quite similar on the Niedertalbahn, the 628 and uh, many other diesel multiple units. I will leave it at that. Thank you very much for bearing with me as much as you bore with me and uh, have a nice time less rain less thunderstorms maybe during the course of the week and if you want see you next sunday thank you aj for moderating my stream have a good night cd radar if you still happen to be there and um yeah take care